Welcome, everyone. Uh, before we start today's webinar, um, I would like to have a few quick announcements. Um, today's session is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office with support from ALA's Cultural Communities Fund. To learn more about the Cultural Communities Fund or make a contribution, visit ala.org slash ccf. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with Programming Librarian, a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. We have a lot of program ideas in an online learning library full of free webinars just like this one. Finally, a couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenter has microphone access, but you are welcome to type your questions or comments in the chat box. You will have time at the end for Q&A. Also, if you have any technical issues, please send a private message to Brian, aka PPO Admin. To do so, hover over PPO Admin in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click Start Private Chat. With that, I would like to turn things over to Jessica Gillis. <coughs> okay, I had to figure out how to turn on my mic. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Jessica Gillis, um, and as chair of the Sarah Jafarian School Library Program Award, I am proud to introduce today's webinar, Tales of the Crypt, Danville's Living History Night, the program series that won the 2018 Sarah Jafarian Award. This award is awarded to a program taught by a certified school librarian that focus on, focuses on the humanities in a creative and engaging manner while incorporating library curriculum skills. We received 10 submissions last year, and while all were very different, the criteria we used to score them, of course, was the same. We looked for innovation and appeal, connection to the curriculum, creativity, active involved learning, involvement and awareness of others in the school, school and community, and whether it contained an evaluation component, and whether it was re replicable for other students and other classes and other teachers to do. So as Kelly um, describes her program, I'm sure you will see that Tales from the Crypt kicks off all those boxes, starting with researching the lives of real people from the past in their own community to the culminating performances that involved the whole town, her program was very creative, exciting for the students, incorporated real-world skills, and above all, sounds like a lot of fun for everyone. So with that, I would like to introduce the program's lead creator, Kelly, Kelly Grover. Kelly is the K-6 librarian at Danville Public Schools in Arkansas. She has been in the field of education for the past 31 years. She is a lifelong learner and reader with a bachelor's degree in education and two masters of education degrees. She is a national board certified librarian and is currently pursuing an administration degree through the IMPACT program at the University of Arkansas. No wonder she uh, provide, presented such a wonderful program for us. Mm -hmm. With that, I would like to turn things over to Kelly. Thank you, Jessica. I'd like to also say thank you to ALA. This has been an exciting experience for us. And I hope I can share with you the <clears throat> passion and the love that we have for this program. And I do encourage each of you, because I do think this could be adaptable for any program. Um, I'm Kelly Clover, and I am the librarian at our elementary and our middle school, and I'm also the director of our Living History program. And we have called it the Tales of the Crypt, Danville's Living History. I had a friend, Becky, and we went on a road trip to Little Rock, Arkansas, our capital, and to their Mount Holly Cemetery. And after we attended Mount Holly Cemetery, which is very similar, and this is what we patterned our program after, I knew that our community had a story to tell. We had history in our town, our small rural town, but it was history that needed to be preserved, and it was history that needed to be told. Danville is located in central Arkansas. We're known as the Arkansas River Valley area. 
We are surrounded by three mountain ranges. We have Petty Jean, Mount Nebo, and Mount Magazine. And we are situated between two national forests. Our county, Yale, you may have heard of this before, in True Grit, which was mentioned in the movie. And it was also uh, with John Wayne, of course, the U.S. Marshal Rooster Cogburn, when they talked of Yale County. Uh, Danville is named after the steamboat The Danville, and this boat piled the Petty Jean River in the 1840s, and the owner of this steamboat, Mr. John Brighthow, became our city's founding father, and yes, he is one of the prominent people that is buried in our cemetery. Mr. John Brighthow owns thousands of acres or hundreds of acres of land here in our town in Danville, he and his wife had one son, Heard, and before and after his wife's death, he had several children with one of his slaves. But due to the laws of the time, she was unable to be buried with Mr. Howe in our old Danville Cemetery. Um, we portray that both Mr. Howe and his wife and their son, Heard, that's pictured on the left, on the right is the Howe family within the fence, and on the outside edges, is his slave, Lucinda, and their children. They are not buried, allowed to be buried in this cemetery, so that's why they're outside the fence to portray that, And we, but we tell their story. Old Danville Cemetery was thought to be established in 1842 from our records, starting with the burial of Mrs. Howe. And interned in this cemetery for the past 175 years, we have veterans of war, doctors, woodmen of the world, lawyers, teachers, judges, children, sheriffs, criminals. The last man hung in our county is buried in this cemetery in an unmarked grave. I knew, growing up in this town, <coughs> that I had some special feelings toward this. And I knew as a teacher that it was very important for our students to know the history of the town that they lived in. And we also wanted to try to help this program to help our cemetery be restored and repaired. So what we did, we formed a committee. And this committee was established to brainstorm. Could this be something that we could possibly do? Um, we recruited art teachers, librarians, music teachers, the mayor, um, of course, the older residents of our town, myself, our, our current public librarian, parents, students, our local newspaper, the principal. Uh, we had a we have a club, Sisters of the Revolution. We just tried to form this committee, and we tried to pick members of this uh, to be on this committee that could all play a part, because we knew they would either have to help support us, they would have information, uh, they would be willing to share, would be willing to let us bring students to them, um, pictures. We just tried to think. So I think the important thing here, when you start to form your committee, is just try to think of everyone in that town that may support you in some way and be willing to help you. And this, these people played a major part and the success of this program. Our students uh, were selected. I'm also the co-director of our after-school program, and it's through the 21st CCLC. And to bring this history to class to life, the best place for me to start was with an after-club student, drama students, and me being the teacher. Um, the club is a semester long, and the living history program is our main project. And because I went through the after-school program, this allowed students to meet with volunteers, people that could come after work, after hours. Um, we also provide a dinner and a snack, um, and this allowed for them. So this allowed for students to have that those meals, and then plus transportation through our after-school program. So for us, this was the best place for us to hold this was to be a part of the after-school program. 
Student, um, we're chosen when we sign up in our after school program. Students are given a list of clubs with descriptions and they are able to pick which club they would like to belong to. And in the description for our after school club for the drama part of the club, obviously they had to show an interest or they would not have signed up for that club. Um, then we take them as a field trip. We take them to Mount Holly, the, the same cemetery I went to when I first heard it. And this cemetery in Little Rock is modeled that we modeled our program after. They use a, they're a magnet school and they um, have a drama club that meet during the school day and it's senior high students. So this is really good for our, our students to see firsthand what that, what is, what we're really talking about, what we're expecting. Um, we were also able to take them to field trips to the, to our local city office, courthouse, our public library, our newspaper. And of course the cemetery is only a couple of blocks away from our school. So all of these field trips except to the Mount Holly, <coughs> we can walk to from our school. Um, and also when students signed up for this, we also sent letters and informed parents of things we would be doing to help gain their support as part of this club. Um, the first thing that we did to start the club after they had chosen to be in this club is we gave them a copy of the census of the cemetery and they went through and looked at dates and at names and, and just things like that to select someone they thought they might want to research. And we thought this was important because we wanted them to pick someone that they had chosen and it was their choice and for them to be able to decide who they wanted. And then the research process started. Um, our club is open from third graders through eighth graders. So some of the students were more familiar with researching than others. Um, so we just started out with a real basic that we looked for the five W's, like who were they, uh, when, did, when were they buried in the cemetery, or, or where did they live, well, anything interesting about them. We talked about patterns for sickness, epidemics. Uh, we made sure we paid attention to the time so they could later research style of clothing or trends or just anything interesting they could find. Um, this is where many of our volunteers, this is where many of our um, local people, our public librarians all came in and helped because as a school librarian at the time, we did not have a lot of genealogy records and access to those with websites. Um, and so, but our public library of course did. So we were able to take them over to that. Uh, our courthouse was full of records. Our a uh, local newspaper, um, love to t have history and, and um, lots of pictures, lots of information. And I helped promote on social media, I'd send letters, I talked to people, anybody that I knew that had any kind of history background or knew anything about any of these people, uh, that was the part I played, is gathering up those resources <clears throat> and setting up a lot of this ahead of time. So when I did have the students there, we, we knew where we were going, who we were bringing in, how to help them research, um, and, go, and then we talked obviously about copyrights, uh, primary sources, just like you would in a library, but they were getting it in this club also. Um, we were able to find actual living uh, family members that were close that were willing to come in and let our students interview them. Um, help out making costumes and, and they, this is where the community volunteers started to buy in and started to help. They realized the history, they realized how, how uh, appropriate what a program this was going to be so they were willing to put their time into it, they were willing to uh, help make costumes, they were willing to just give a lot to help us promote this program. Um, they were told what was expected at the beginning when we talked with them. Um, I found their strengths just like I would in students. Um, and that is another, I think, big buy-in is they weren't asked to do anything they didn't feel comfortable with. We worked around their schedule as much as possible. And we have had so many people 
appreciate, send us notes, donate money, phone calls about how they felt needed and involved, and they were so proud not to have been forgotten. Um, of course, parents, if you have students in it, parents are going to usually be there and be a part of it. <clears throat> our community members, our mayor, um, they really bought into this project and knew how important it was for our kids. And we live in a really small rural area, and so a lot of our adults, if we drive or go anywhere, we're about an hour away, wherever we have to go, to like to a movie theater, two to three hours away if we want to see any kind of plays, that type of thing. So this is an opportunity, too, for those community members that like this kind of thing or liked acting or liked the theater arts. This was a chance for them as well to be part of it. Um, and I've kind of talked about this already, but <laughs> this is a picture of, it's, they're cute, but it's a sad story. Um, the lady in the back is a, a retired um, band director, and she's also a retired teacher. And these are three of the little girls that we researched. Now, these guys are a little younger than third grade, but they had older brothers or sisters or parents that were in the program, and we needed some young girls, and so that's how these uh, three young ladies were selected. But each one of these were daughters of a family that's in the uh, cemetery, and each one died due to an epidemic, a sickness, that several of this, these same family had. So as you walk into our cemetery, um, Mrs. Gray, our, our teacher here, is playing a auto harp and these girls are singing and then they're telling their story. So you have this music as it's going across the cemetery and it adds a lot to it. Um, did take us lots of time, lots of practice, because after the research, after the students would research, we want it into a, like a four-minute dialogue. And so after the research, then they had to just go about putting it in their own words and thinking about how they was going to become that person and, and tell that person's story. And this took a lot of practice for them to realize this is not something I'm memorizing. It's not a word-by-word -word thing. I'm just telling these people's story, and I'm paying honor to them. Um, so after the research, they would write it. They would practice saying it. We'd talk about it. We'd go back and revamp it. Um, and I have pictures here of our uh, teachers, our parents, our community members, our superintendent, um, and then how we went out to the cemetery. Like today, while I'm doing this webinar, um, <clears throat> I have about five volunteers that's taken our group out to the cemetery because our program, our fourth one, fourth annual one, is next week. So they're out at the cemetery now getting familiar with their parts, practicing how their voice will be different outside, and that type of thing. Um, and in that census, uh, we made sure that we included uh, prominent people, people that would be important, people that have made the town what it is today, or established the town, or brought different projects into the town. Um, we've already talked about the Howe family, and this young lady on the left, or, or my left, is Lucinda. She's the slave. Um, the family in the middle was the founding. They brought in a lot of things to our community. Um, our judge in the middle, bottom middle, um, prominent, their families, bankers, mayors. And, of course, what makes it interesting is this is the man that was hung, the last man hung in Yale County. Um, he has a gruesome story, and but he is buried there in an unmarked grave, and this is the sheriff that brought him in. Uh, we made sure to honor our veterans, and even today when we're not doing this program, these students have bought into it, the community's bought into it. Um, at Veterans Now, flags are placed upon the graves. Um, students go out and place flowers. And it's just been a really honor and respectful thing for our, for our veterans. We add some. It's not a spooky, uh, scary, uh, spook house type thing. But we do do it this time of year. And there is some, a little, you have to know, being out in the cemetery at night, it is a little creepy. Um, so we do honor those people. And the, we, the stories we tell are true. 
Uh, but we also do talk about death, and this is where we add a little of the eeriness in it. And this is, uh, we have superstitions set out throughout the cemetery. Um, and you can see some of our lanterns or props that we take out. Um, but they tell different superstitions of death for that time period of this cemetery. Each cemetery, each, the night, it starts at 6.30, and we just kind of divide the cemetery to two sides, and each side will have a tour leader, and each group of tours will be about 10 people. So the tour guides will take their 10 people, and you can see lanterns, you can see we have uh, luminaries set up, you can see our little white bags to mark the path as it gets dark. Um, they'll tell a brief history of our cemetery. And then they will take their side and lead them around. They have a little map, and they've practiced this also. And they know which uh, stop will be on their side. And each tour lasts about 30 minutes. Then we walk them back out, of course, by the donation jar, if they would like to donate. Um, and we give them a program as they come in to tell about the people and who's portraying and has pictures in it. Um, and then they will just start their tours back over each time. And this is a special slide for us because this was one of our high school teachers. And um, she has passed away. We lost her last year due to a, a quick illness with cancer. So we always have her now because um, we also sell these on DVD. So we have her talking and, and helping us out. So this makes a very special slide for us. Um, donations, we do have a donation table set up. We do not charge because, I, uh, like I said, we're in a really um, rural, poor community. Not a, you know, a lot of high free and reduced lunch. And so we don't want anyone in our town not to be able to come and enjoy this. So we do not charge. It's totally a donation only. Um, but because of the families that we've portrayed and the guests over the last three years, we have had donated over $15,000, um, and we've been able to use that money to um, purchase different things that I'll show you uh, in a little bit with very little cost to us at all. Um, we purchased pizza, the night of the drama. Uh, I may buy a few thank yous um, from Walmart. We might spend maybe $100. A lot of times this is... Um, from my library fund, and now that we've started building up money, we of course now we have that money. Um, so it's it's just been phenomenal. Um, we we have lots of media coverage, the local newspapers, our local cable. Um, we connected with our senior seminar class, which is made up of 11th and 12th graders, and they make all of our. Um, posters, our pamphlets, they create the DVD for us, they're out that night filming. Um, our local cable advertises it for us. Of course, I, I'm the one that was, I send in all the things, that's part of my job, um, to the newspaper, the local cable, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we send notes home to students through the whole school inviting people. We hang up things around the um, local businesses to advertise. And you can see um, a poster that we have that we set around town. And, um, you know, it's just such a, a great, great opportunity for these kids. This young man here, he's uh, being interviewed from a newspaper that's in a town close to us. And um, this, this young guy has a speech impediment and it was very, very nervous, but it was something he really wanted to do. Um, and now his his mom, his grandmother, he's in like Christmas programs. We have a school play. He even sang in it. Uh, he's, it's just amazing what this will do for these students. Um, and talking about that, it it really builds their self esteem. Uh, their school attendance they never miss when we have uh, after school. Uh, this is going on. They're going to be here every day. It really helps their verbal, their nonverbal communication. And when we talk with their teachers, 
Um, they tell us they can tell the kids it's been to this because research is just something easier for them. They understand about the note taking, they understand about copyrights and, and putting it in your own words and they're just able to go through and pick out things, the important things. So the classroom teachers tell us that they can tell a big difference. Um, our principals tell us they can tell when kids come to their office, when they see them at 10 or in the hallway. Uh, they're they're not afraid to speak, um, and it's building that community, that relationship with the community, because um, these the community love these guys and they love them, and they're so proud to see them. And it's just been a really good thing to, uh, for our school to connect to our community in a very positive way. Um, you see a picture here of us receiving the award that we won, and we were so excited. But you also see our students. At a school board meeting, getting to be able to be recognized and and applauded for their efforts uh, in this program outcome, we are like I said, starting our fourth annual living history. Um, we never, I knew, did not dream about it being as, as successful as it was. Um, because of this, now we have a drama club, which I am not a drama teacher, but I am now. And it's the elementary middle school drama club. And because of the huge response, we do a spring play now. Um, that's a whole nother program, whole nother story. Uh, but our last year was a hee haw. And you see the advertisement for that. Quite entertaining. And this is a group uh, of our students and teachers dressed in their costumes on their way over to the cemetery. Uh, the night last year. Of course, one of the benefits that you never think about is the recognition of your school, of your library, state and national. Um, we are writing an article now for Knowledge Quest. Uh, we did receive $5,000. Could not be more excited and more proud to be the recipient of that. We're here doing a webinar. Um, we've been asked to present at several conferences in our state. Um, we're going to our state department and being recognized there. So it, that, but that is just a small part of the benefits of this. But that is one of the benefits for sure. But that's not, our, that wasn't our main goal to start out with. And like I said, that's just a side to all the other, to our students and community. Um, uh, this cemetery now is uh, on the state national historic register. Um, we're in nomination for the national, um, and you know if you're on the national register, you are able to um, apply for many humanity grants if you need to. Um, the state of Arkansas brought in an expert from, I think Mon Montana. I'm not for sure. Sorry about it, but um, he's known well. Uh, state. Uh, United States, throughout the United States for repairing tombstones and cemeteries. And they, and they chose our cemetery to uh, hold a workshop. And we had people from all over the United States come to that workshop as this uh, gentleman taught us how to re properly repair. Um, and our city has been a, a, they've been a tremendous part and help in this. Um, they have bought totally into this. They take care of the cemetery. They they take care of fire ants. They keep it mowed. Um, and they even bought all the necessary um, supplies needed to repair those tombstones. But now that we have built up money in our account, they are on the account with us because if we go through them. Um, they help us to bring these people in and to repair. And they do a lot of the groundwork for us, the lifting, the digging trenches, any of that type of thing, they do with no charge to us. So they're a great big partner with us. Um, the cemetery, like I said, is now, everybody knows where the cemetery is. Um, we've had the money donated for the upkeep, and that's for repairing of the tombstones. A uh, flagpole has been erected. Uh, we have a bench. Veterans are placed. We purchased the sign you can see in our um, picture here. Because we didn't even have, there was nothing there to recognize. No one knew the name of it. Uh, it was just in a disarray. 
um, the front entrance. We I should have put a picture on of the front entrance. We are going to have uh, rock columns with gates, uh, black. They're going to be black gates. They're just beautiful. So the front entrance, the sign, um, the repairs. It's just going to be a, a beautiful cemetery. Students. Uh, another thing they do is they learn that service ship, that ownership. Uh, you see them out there cleaning. This is something we do uh, before each performance. Um, this is something we do in the spring. They were part of that repairing. Um, these students you'll see, you'll go by now and there'll be flowers out. They just take ownership of who they belong to or, or who they are in the play. Uh, we've had a lot of suggestions. Uh, you know, they'd like to see more. They'd like for us to go to the nursing home. They'd like for us to create a Facebook web page so that people could upload and help us add new information. Oh, they've talked about an audition to be like the American Idol, which we did last year for our newcomers. We let our students from the <clears throat> that had been in it before. Uh, they were able to be the judges. Oh, they had some amazing questions. Uh, kids had to audition, even though they were in the club, had to audition. Um, it was just such growth for both sides there. Um, these students, uh, if they choose to be in it again, they can choose to have the same part or they can choose to do have a different part. So they become very uh, big helpers, mentors to the new newbies, we call them. Um, and this is another benefit to those students. Um, we are working on creating a web page of Facebook for this. Because um, we have so many people that are inter in this, interested in this and are always sending us uh, pictures and information. Um, and I, I appreciate you listening. And I have my contact information. Uh, we're willing to share anything, answer any questions. And it's just a great thing for our community and our school. And again, we appreciate ALA and this opportunity to share. Thank you, Kelly. That was great. Um, so right now we have some time left um, for Q&A. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box, and we will answer those. It looks like we have some people typing, so we'll just um, wait for them. So Janice has a question. She was wondering if adult volunteers uh, were giving a background check before working with the children. Um, 90% of our volunteers were retired teachers, uh, public librarians. They had jobs that had uh, required them to have a background check. They worked for the city, the police department, that type. The ones that um, did not, never that we did not know any about a background check, never directly worked with the students. Um, they might have been on the committee to help organize um, resources, bringing in uh, field trips or that type of thing. But if they directly work with the student, uh, they did have a background check. Not the ones that we gave, but was required from where they were working at or, or had already obtained one. <laughs> Um, Julie is wondering if you could recommend some references like Find a Grave to help uh, start with the research process. Um, our public librarian um, had, um, which we do now because of some of our money, we've been able to purchase some of this here at our school library, Genealogy Hound, Ancestor.com, uh, Find a Grave, um, and we had just several uh, local people that had references and materials they brought in and had already looked up a lot of, of research. So a lot of things they had, our students went through, and that was where they gathered some of their information, too, was just from um, resources that 
a lot of these volunteers had already gathered up. So that, again, that was part of their research, <clears throat> but our kids went through theirs to find the information they needed and wanted. <clears throat> I can for sure look, Julie, if she would like to send me her email, and I can look and, and make sure I haven't missed anything and can send her some more if she would like that. That'd be great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so while we're waiting for anyone else with more questions, uh, if you had one piece of advice for a librarian thinking about uh, starting a program like this, what would that be? Um, I think for me, I think you would have to be dedicated to and want for the reason that you're doing it, uh, the purpose of it, because it does take a lot of your time. Uh, even though we're on like our fourth year, it is a lot of part on my part, a lot of time getting all this set up. Be because it's so uh, personal and important to me, I guess I don't think about that, but I think most of us as librarians do that anyway, have a lot of extra time that we spend on projects and getting it at the forefront. And I think that's your your thing is you need to plan on a lot at the beginning, but once it, the program gets started, then you're there more as a facilitator and not gathering up and setting up a lot of the uh, things. But it is a lot on the front end of it, but it but it's like, again, so worth it. So I think the the main thing I would suggest would be gathering up your volunteers, knowing your community, knowing where those strengths are, and knowing how well, how they can help you, and knowing how uh, what their strengths. Like I said, their strengths so they can help you because that's the you can't do it by yourself. It's too much, and so I, we couldn't do it without our volunteers. Yeah, this sounds like a, a lot of work. It's it's a really great program, though. Uh, how much time would you say that you, on average, commit each year to this? Oh, that would be, well, we start in September, and that's just with the students. But I've already gathered up all of my volunteers and, and that type of thing. I would say, gosh, we meet four days a week. Uh, from 3.30 to 5 each each one of those days with these students. Um, uh, and we, because we follow the same schedule as our after school program. And so, um, and that was from September till November. And then in the spring, now that we started doing our drama in the spring, we start again in January. And that goes until March. So, um, that's how much time we spend with the students. And I just have to be prepared, just as any other teacher or librarian. I just have to have all my resources and lessons or plans or whatever I have before that. And that takes, it's getting easier now, because we've been doing it a while. But I'd probably say a month on each end. So it's quite a bit of time. Yeah, sounds like it. But, that because we do it through our after school program, it makes it so much easier because I have them every day. It's almost like having a drama class, even though I'm not a drama teacher and I don't have drama class time, I do through our after school program or club. Great. <clears throat> Great. Um, so we still have some time left if anyone has any additional questions. And Jessica is saying you did such a great job uh, describing it that no one has any additional questions. So <laughs> if, <laughs> if uh, we'll hang out in the room for another uh, five or so minutes in case anyone thinks of anything. But in the meantime, um, I just want to say a huge thank you to Kelly and, of course, Jessica for introducing the session. But Kelly for uh, this presentation and to all of you for joining us today. Um, this webinar will be available for viewing on programminglibrarian.org uh, sometime tomorrow, and we will send out a link to it once that's available. Thank you, ladies, so very much.
Sorry, I probably did talk a whole lot. <laughs> I'm no, very passionate great. about this, though. I, I, it's something that's a, a lot means a lot to me personally. Just I think because of growing up in this town, but just those people just need that respect and honor brought to them, and it's great for our kids to do it. Yes, I agree. This is a great program. And uh, Tamara is asking if you'll receive a note of attendance. Um, Tamara, if you email me at soakley at ala.org, I can send you a letter that verifies that you attended this presentation. Oh, and Janice is wondering what gave you the idea to do this uh, program. I love to travel. And we saw in, in our, like I said, our state capital of Little Rock, which is about a two and a half hour trip away, where they were doing this cemetery visit or tour. And so it sounded like fun. So we thought we'd go and check it out. And oh, it was amazing. And so that, while we were there, I thought we could do this at our town on a smaller scale. But we have some people that are very prominent and our, our students need to know where their history is. And so after attending that, we came back and patterned our program very similar to theirs and, and met with that committee. And they said, yes, we can do this. And we can, we'll support you. And so that's where the idea came, is with us traveling to another program. <clears throat> Great. And yeah, it's a, as you mentioned, it's a great way to ensure that um, people in your community aren't forgotten once uh, mm -hmm. as time goes on. And no one has been buried in this cemetery since 1960. That's the last burial that's stopped, you know, from there. So a lot of these people, um, are, are they don't even have family here anymore because of is so old. So, you know, without us telling their story, their story will never be told because their ancestors, many of them are gone to. Uh, vandalism um, is something that um, I, our kids would be crushed if that happened. And I think this was a, a great way for us to, to talk about that and, and talk about how important it is that we own and have ownership and and make that connection and so no, that I don't think we would ever have any trouble with anyone wanting to vandalize or because they're just so proud of it now. That's great, yeah. And if anyone that, that was attending or anyone has any questions, I please feel free to email me. We, we love to share. Um, we, don't, we don't mind to share any, anything we have or answer any questions. Yes. And uh, Kelly's information is up there on the screen. If you would like to um, email her, or um, you can also email uh, the Public Programs Office if you have any questions specifically for ALA. OK. Great. Um, OK. We'll wait for the one person to finish typing up. And uh, yep, uh, Colleen is just saying this is such a cool program. So we will go ahead and let everyone go. Um, thank you again to Kelly for this presentation and um, for all of you for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha.